What's up? Hi, thank you so much. Um, let's get started. All right. Boots, you have such a fascinating background. Your parents were political organizers and activists. And I'm curious, was that their ambition for you? Uh, I don't, I don't think, well, I think they were so busy that I never really got to get what their ambition was for me. You know, like they're, you know, organizing takes a lot of time and a lot of times the kids are there. And so you pick up things, um, but, but I think, uh, so, so I wasn't pushed in any particular direction. Um, and I think that's maybe what made me more follow in those footsteps is because um, the, actually when I started, when I turned 14 and I started becoming more politically aware of the world, I, I had an attitude, I, I got mad at my father. I was like, well, why didn't you tell me? about this you know what like what what were you hiding from me because he had been involved in radical organizations and i had been all ar around that stuff but it was never explained to me like here's how the world works here's what i believe this and that and so um when i came into it it became my own thing so i i didn't think i was doing their thing and and i did see other folks in the organization that i joined uh, that were older, that had kids who felt like that, like, no, that's my parents' thing. That's, you know, and, and I'm not doing that. So, no, I, I think they just kind of let me be, right? They, uh, they, they let me come into things on my own. Um, and, and, and I don't know how much of that was just benign negligence, you know, <laughs> just because of being, of, of working and, trying to do other things and how much of it was 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 you know planned when they would discuss activism with you or their history as activists what would they say well so what i did know it, it's interesting because so in the 80s is when i was of age where everybody has you do reports on your family like you're going to interview somebody from your family and and of course what you know my father before he was in the more radical stuff he was in the civil rights movement and so that was what I often you know would be like oh I'm gonna do a report on my father he was in the civil rights movement he you know uh, NAACP core did you know uh, moderated a talk with Malcolm X all that sort of stuff so I, I would be talking about those things and a lot of times, those things would be framed in uh, in 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 the in sort of the more popular uh, mainstream media ways of talking about those ideas: fighting for freedom, fighting for rights, but without specifying what those were. And um, little, as I got older, little by little, I, I would see. Um, you know, the class analysis come out. Cause he didn't ever come out and say, look, this is how capitalism works. This is, it's a struggle from, uh, of the working class against the ruling class. And this is what we need to do. Um, because by the time I was doing those things, it was the eighties and he had also left the radical organization that he had been in and become a public defender. So, uh, you know, there were all sorts of complications in the telling of the story as it as it came so um yeah it, i think um what i did gather though was enough to let me know that once i once i started getting involved in radical organizations that i knew that they wouldn't be against it which was not what everybody that were my peers thought um that when i was in high school uh you know, we had led this walkout and I was involved in this radical organization called the Progressive Labor Party, which is a uh, communist organization. And um, the principal, uh, it was a successful walkout and the principal, brought, principal was an ex-cop and uh, this big buff dude named Mr. O'Leary, he brought me in and interrogated me with armed, with, with uniformed police officers, just saying, we know what you're up to. We know, you know, you're agitating here and we're, you know, we're watching you. And, um, and 
for me, it just made me feel important, right? But for my girlfriend at the time, who was a seventh seventh day at Venice, they were like, "We're we're we're calling your pastor, we're calling your parents. Don't talk to him anymore." And that was that, <laughs> you know, and um and and so. That was the extreme version of that, but I knew that I I had support. When you started organizing in high school, what was sort of the inspiration? Other like, what were you organizing to do? Well, so my entrance into organizing was when I was fourteen. Um, well, I, I when I was fourteen. Um, some friends of the family had said, hey, we got this youth organization. Um, we're gonna, we do stuff on the weekends. You wanna be part of it? And you know, like a lot of kids my age, I was flaky and I was like, yeah, just come by. And I planned to totally not be there. <laughs> and I forgot about it, so I was there. And it was, <laughs> and, and it was Saturday and it was a, a, a you know, a youth organizer and they, they came with a van and it was full of 14 year old girls. And they were like, hey, uh, you wanna come to the beach? But first we're gonna, and I was like, yeah. And they were like, but first we're gonna stop by and support the Watsonville cannery workers strike. And I was like, okay. And, um, and I got in the van and what, and and the the you know because I know some of these folks now so they're girls then but women uh, who they they were very uh, politically advanced and I heard them talking about things that you know were, were that I had been shutting out you know things that were on the news um, you know talking about the world as if they could actually change it. Right, as if they had something to do with it. And I realized, it, and, and, and I started, you know, I, I went into the van with the idea that, oh, you know, here's some girls, let me talk to them. But I was like, oh, here's some girls, let me talk to them. Now, you know, like after a while, it was like I wanted to be them, you know? Um, and so, but through those experiences of the cannery workers strike, um, I then, uh, volunteered to be part of they had a uh they had a a, a summer uh what they call it but like, like a summer program to uh help the uh striking uh striking farm workers in the delano mcfarland area um and they, they had this program with a bunch of uh more of a, a radical offshoot of the united farm workers who had all left there because the United Farm Workers at the time had even some very racist policies where they were calling, you know, uh, undocumented immigrants, wetbacks. They were working with the, and they, they, they stopped doing that, but they were working with the immigration and deporting people and all that. So these were radicals who had broken off from them and created their own thing called the Anti Racist Farm Workers Union. And they needed people to just like run. Dittos run flood. This is still in the ditto days. Run, run dittos and um, put flyers on cars and and make posters and stuff like that. So I went there and I saw and 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 the folks that were leading that had been um, uh, they they had been involved. They had been originally Mexican students in the 1968. Um, in, in some of the bloody 1968 battles that had happened in Mexico City and had moved to, and had, instead of just fleeing Mexico, decided they wanted to keep building a revolution. And they heard about Cesar Chavez and were like, okay, let's go over there. Um, and then they found out that he wasn't, you know, the radical that they hoped he would be and they started this thing. And so these were the folks that I was interacting with and they had definitely a plan of what they were gonna do in that valley, right? And how their actions there connected to this broader struggle to uh, change the whole economic system. And so 
that's just a long way of answering. So when I would go to those summer projects, I was doing things that I would never have done in high school. Like, you know, like to ask a high school kid to even pass out a flyer or something like that. Like for me, I, I would have never done it. I would have never talked to somebody about um, a political idea that they might disagree with, right? I, but but being there, I saw how people were working. So when I came back, we we had gotten involved in a, um, there was a, a, a struggle around year round schools where they were, basically they were taking all the resources from uh, all the, the schools that were mainly uh, black and Asian and putting, using, it, it, without explaining the complicated thing, there at the time there was one school that was mainly white and that was Skyline High. And they were the only ones that weren't going to have year round school. And so basically we were like, let's do a walkout against year round school. And it, I don't care who you are, whatever the politics are, it's easy to get high school kids to walk out against year round school. <laughs> You know, like there's no struggle in that. Like we announced it and three days later we had a walkout. <laughs> and it, but it was the first thing like that I had been involved with. 2,000 of the 2,200 kids came out in front of the thing and, the, and, and we had this, and, and, and I had the bullhorn because, you know, we had, and, but I still was like, I didn't know what to do. And the big cop, uh, ex-cop uh, principal came out and goes, Riley, give me that bullhorn. And I was like, okay. And everybody's like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> and all the kids rushed and grabbed it with me. And we're all, there's like 10 of us having a tug of war with this big buff, uh, you know, principal. And he's dragging us around. And then this guy, Navin, got his arm cut and blood splattered over uh, the principal's shirt. And that was the first time I saw a color photograph in the Oakland Tribune, which was students attack principal in walkout. And it had a red, you know, him with the white shirt with blood all over it as if it was his blood. Wow. So, um, you know, so those sorts of ironies definitely affect <laughs> what the kind of stuff I do. How did you become more confident in your voice as an activist during that time? Repetition. That's it. You know, um, also talking to people and realizing that often we're saying the same thing. And because um, I think at the time, a lot of the older folks that were in the organizations I was involved with, you know, now that I think about, you know, I thought they were really old. They were like in their 20s you know they were in their late 20s or whatever and um so that means that they were you know in the 70s they were teenagers right so um and then there were people that were older than them that were, were you know their heyday was in the 60s and so there was all this stuff about lingo like they'd argue with people until people were saying the same things with the same words and um, I started to see the the connections and the things that people want in life and um, and started to realize that I could word things differently, I could present things differently, and I think all of trying those things led to that comfort. But I would say um, that, you know, when you're working on... Um, these campaigns, like, you know, doing the farm workers thing, like, you're basically told it, it kind of doesn't matter that you're shy. This has to get done, right? So you realize that it's, that, that there's something more important than the, the discomfort you're feeling from doing it. So they'll be like, look, somebody has to, uh, do this, like, we do skits, because this was right after the, uh, time of uh, the, the uh, I forget, the, the, the uh, Teatro Campesino. So they had been in that area like 15 years before. And so people were trying to do the same thing. So we do these corny skits, like it'd be, we, we the, the folks we were working with, um, they worked in, in the fields and they'd be like at three in the morning, okay, we need a skit about this. We need this, we need the, the 
we need the the caravan to come there and we need the flatbed truck and we need speakers on it and somebody needs to make a speech about this and you know we're like teenagers and and they're like we're going to be working all day and we're coming off the fields with everybody so if you don't do it it doesn't get done if it doesn't get done this campaign doesn't work if this campaign you know you it keeps going with that so you learn to you 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 make it not about yourself and you kind of become the person that you need to be um, because you realize it's not about whether you're good enough or not. I want to jump ahead a little bit in your life. You studied film at San Francisco State. What attracted you to filmmaking? Um, so after that period of doing the corny skits and stuff, I started doing, um, started getting in the theater. Now, my mother's mother um, had been the director of Oakland Ensemble Theater in the 70s. And, um, and so that, that even more was like, that's something that's not mine, right? But after these experiences, I was like, okay, maybe I could, we could do theater, we could do revolutionary theater. And um, I joined um, uh, the Black Repertory Group, which was in a storefront in Berkeley. Um, now they have this this bigger theater in, in, in Berkeley. But it was a, a storefront that was probably two and a half times the size of this stage, right? And um, But we had folks like Roger Guinevere Smith would come through and do you know, his Frederick Douglass one-man play, things like that, um, and we would, you know, the, the, the after school group, we would try to put together plays. And after a while, I was like, okay, like 30 people can fit in this theater. That's gonna be a lot of plays that have to get done to like build a revolution. <laughs> and um, so it was a little, you know, I, I was trying to figure out, you know, how that would all work. And then I saw uh, do the right thing, right? And um, started think, you know, like, okay, he's putting his ideas in this. And, you know, uh, be, and, and I think before that, not that I didn't have an analysis that said that movies put out ideas, but it didn't seem achievable. It seemed like just a whole world that I had no idea about. So, um, you know, when once I went to San Francisco State, they have a film film program. So I did that, and um, there was a group of folks that called themselves the Zulu Film Club. And if you were a dude, and in the Zulu Film Club, you wore, you tried to look like Spike Lee, <laughs> and um, th and uh, but. All those folks are still my friends. Uh, matter of fact, uh, Dre Finley, he's a supervising sound producer on, on I'm a Virgo and works at Skywalker. So, um, you know, yeah. So the, the, that was like the, the culmination of it. Okay. And then you left San Francisco State because the coup got a record deal. Yeah. How were you feeling during that time? Did you have any doubts? Well, I didn't, you know... I never thought about because because my goals were lofty enough to that 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 were way bigger than paying the rent, right? So I never I never thought about making those kind of decisions in the first place. And maybe you know that has to do with the support of the family, whatever. But I also knew that I could you know I sold weed I worked at retail, I had done, you know, I was like, I can figure it, I didn't have any kids at the time, so I was like, I can figure it out. Um, so I wasn't worried about that. And right then, you know, it was a time when every record label had to have a group from Oakland. So we just happened to be there and at the time and, and, and using the, the, the skills that I got from actually organizing, we made, our, you know, we had a tape, uh, uh, an EP on, uh, on with a black and white cover, and we made up posters and we just wheat pasted all over the Bay Area to where 
you know, you know, you're gonna say, who the fuck is this, right? Who is this? So we were doing that at a, at that time, and and at the record store, you know, it was there were three um, groups that were the top selling independent groups, and that was us, a dude named Dangerous Dame, and E40, right? And E40, you know, his, you know, me, I, and everybody got offered deals. And I was just like taking the first bus coming, right? Because my whole thing was I'm, I need this stuff to get out there. Um, so I didn't have any, any doubts because it was all like a new, you know, adventure. What was motivating you to make music during those early years? I mean, this 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 sense of wanting to get, you know, wanting to communicate. I think art is communication, right? So um, I had all these ideas, all these th ways that I wanted to talk about the world. And um, I also knew that art is different than just talking because it 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 talks about the ideas in between the words, right? The The feelings and the emotions and... Um, and, and when you talk to someone, you know, and that's something I learned from organizing, from being forced to do that, from being forced to talk to people that may not agree with me is like, make sure we have a connection that you know where I'm coming from, you know what I care about, you know what I'm thinking about. And with music, um, that's something that I'm doing. I'm connecting with like whoever's listening right then. Um, and so I wanted to connect with people and wanted to to um, share this this thing. So. Your music with the coup all had a strong sense of story and narrative and was very vivid and visual. Where did that quality in your writing come from? Well, the the theater and film, right? So we uh, when we got the record deal, I was like, part of it was this. I was. You know, and I think one one of the, I'll say this. So this is the connection. One, you know, there's always this period, often this period where you're saying I'm gonna do this thing, and it just it doesn't get done. And you know, like so there was a period where I'm like I'm gonna make a demo tape. I'm gonna make a demo tape. Then I heard that Spike Lee had 40 Acres and a Mule, Mule Music, and I was like, damn, if I actually made my demo tape, I could send it in. And whoever's working there is going to like it. And then Spike Lee might hear my music, and then I might actually get to meet him, right? And um, so that was always intertwined, right, with, with, with you know, all of those thoughts of how I would do it. And so then when we got the record deal, I was like, well, I don't even have enough money to finish the, the 8 millimeter and 16 millimeter films I'm doing at um, school. So this is a way that I can tell story, you know, I can make people see the movie, you know, in their head. And then separately, I had hoped to get the record label to let me direct some videos. But they were always like, okay, if, if you direct the video, the budget is here. And if you let somebody we trust direct the video, the budget is here. So, you know, the idea took precedence. What I wanted to get out there took precedence. And I didn't direct those. When did, or I should say how, did filmmaking eclipse music as your primary medium? Um, well, there's, there's a couple steps to that, that, that thing. Um, because at San Francisco State, I didn't get taught any like narrative or screenwriting or anything like that, it, you know, so I, even though I wanted to do film, I now was, at, at a certain point, was immersed in something that I felt I was really good at. And at, at one point, um, a director I had met was like, um, will you write the, I'm writing this movie, will you write, and it takes place in the black community, can you write the dialogue for me? And I'll write, I, I'm, I have the story, you just change the dialogue. And so I was like, okay, let me try it. And so that let me see how Final Draft worked, right? Because I was doing that. And then I was like, well, this person, she wouldn't say that. You know, this doesn't make sense. Like, 
So we got to change the story after then. He was like, no. I was like, well, why would she do that? And he was like, oh, she'd do that because she's a bitch, right? And I was like, okay, so it, it made me uh, think about it, that, that. And so I didn't do it, didn't finish doing that. And, um, but it made me think about, it made me get confident that, okay, I could do this. I could make it happen. Here's somebody that is making movies, and I think I'm doing it. I think I could do it better than he's doing. And, and I just got just the tactile comfort with the, the program. Um, but then it didn't till many years later, um, after I, I did a project called Street Sweeper Social Club with Tom Morello. And um, usually up until then, you know, um, with the coup, I, I'm producing the music, I'm writing the songs, and this was a collaborative effort. And, um, you know, and I think for, for all that both me and Tom talk about collaboration, there's a problem that happens <laughs> with that too. And so the way we did this was he did all the music, I did the lyrics. And so I was feeling, after we did it, I was feeling some disconnect because that's not how I usually do stuff, right? And so I was sitting in a hotel room and, um, and I felt, and I, and I think I was, because these were like bigger shows than I had ever been, but I still was feeling a disconnect from it. I had never felt that feeling like, uh, you know, like what am I doing? And, um, and so I said, oh, I'm just gonna do something that I have no idea whether it will pan out financially or not. And I downloaded Final Draft in a hotel and started writing. And from that day on, that's what it was. And, um, and, and that was 2010. And, um, and, and, and of course, I still had to do performances and still did an, did an album since then. But um, there, there was a period where I, I knew the only way I was going to make the movie happen was by not touring and by focusing on it. And, and that, that came at a big financial sacrifice where we were squatting a house, we were you know, doing all those things, and I was promising people that it was going to pay off at some point, but I was lying, um, and it just happened to work. <laughs> <laughs> so before we get into more of your work on screen, let's check out a teaser for I'm a Virgo. All right. You know, you're a big motherfucker. All the wear and tear that you're putting on this house, I mean, just leaning on the walls, you're putting holes in them. And I gotta fix this shit myself. Cause I don't want nobody to see your big ass. The world is not ready yet. I have to get out of here. People are gonna try to use you. Yours is ready, big man. He prophesized you. Well, I'm a Virgo. And Virgos love adventure. Thanks. <laughs> So tell me about the earliest stage of this idea. How did it come to you? Um, well, usually I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what feelings are hard to explain in cinema or in art and, you know, and I'm, I'm starting with that problem. Like what, what's something that, it, you know, and, and so I'm constantly thinking about that. Like how do you, make someone feel something rather than just know it in your art because you can explain it and they get the idea, but how do you make them go through that emotional process? And so I'm always thinking about those things. And I, um, and so uh, in, you know, in Congress was that, with that was this 
time uh, at Sundance, right when we had sold Sorry to Bother You. And again, like I said, I've been broke and promising people it was going to make money. And um, somebody let out the, you know, we thought we were going to sell it and make a bunch of money at Sundance. And somebody leaked out what the actual budget was. So we just basically made, got, were able to pay the investors back. So I'm sitting with this buzz of Sundance with no money thinking I'm going to have to get a job. And um, WME was like, well, if you got ideas, we can get you paid. And I said, 13 foot tall black man in Oakland. <laughs> because that was a, a, a thought that I had had. Like, I didn't know exactly, I didn't know exactly what the story was going to be, but I knew that it spoke to a contradiction you know, if I could go in that character, go inside that character. And, and for me, with a lot of my songs, um, I'm, I'm, you know, they, they are seemingly varied, right? Like they, and they are, you know, from not wanting to get out of bed with your girlfriend in the morning to uh, lying to your boss to a uh, song to my daughter to, but, but they all, I, I'm always making sure that my, view of the world are inside those details. So I'm always pretty confident that, you know, I could tell the story of how this projector is made and, um, and get to my ideas because that's how I view the world. So I, I, that's all I knew was that it was 13 foot tall black men in Oakland. And I said, and everybody was like, let's do it. Right. <laughs> and then, so, um, and, 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 but, but then as I wrote it, uh, you know, I, I started writing it beginning of 2019, um, did, did a deal with Media Res 2018, started writing it 2019. And, um, you know, I, I think it became a little bit, uh, you know, once we, once we took that pilot out, I think people were kind of scratching their head, like, how are you going to do this? How much is this going to cost? Um, you know all those questions so um you know the all, but 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 yes the for me there's always the big ideas and then there i have to connect the idea of how the world works to actually the humanity in people in 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 me and 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 my own uh you know my own faults as well like i have to be in touch with that to make the the characters more human how did you decide it would be a series and not a feature? Uh, that was more like, uh, just being honest, that's, where the, the, that's what I was being offered. So I was like, okay, this is one that could be a series. <laughs> you know, that was, a, I, I'll say this. I think there are all sorts of different ways to tell stories. Um, I'm more inclined toward the stories that end, right? I like stories to end. And, um, and, and, um, and, 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 and I think there is, and I don't think that's right. I don't think that's a better story. To, I think that's just what I'm used to because I think that you could make a case that, you know, um, how stories have been told for ages or someone kind of making it up as they go along and they, and, and, you know, they go off on tangents and bring it back. And so, yeah, that, that it's not that that's not real storytelling to do it like that and go on for 22 seasons and figure that out. But, um, you know, that's not what I, I want to, I want to have a thing that's there. And I did that, you know, that sort of a thing. And so, but, with this, I could come up with enough idea that that okay, here's how this could be told over time. And 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 honestly, the whole season, um, you know, they're half hour episodes. The whole season is three and a half hours long. So there's some movies out that are about that long right now. Um, and um, but but yeah, so and and it's all coming out at the same time. So that's how I could be like, all right, cool, let's. Do it like that. <laughs> Watching the first episode, TV and comic books are Cootie's windows into worlds that he's not allowed to participate in. Um, was anything about that relationship to art autobiographical for you? That TVs and movies are? Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. 
I mean, I was one of those kids stuck in front of the TV. Um, and yeah, it was, uh, and, 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 um, but, but no, I did have other ways, but comic, what's, what's definitely, uh, connected is I was obsessed with comic books. You know, I was, um, you know, when I look back on it now, you know, you could even say it was like a psychotic break because I, I was, I started doing gymnastics, you know, seriously, <laughs> throwing ninja stars, reading all the books, uh, you know, practicing coming into a room where you can't hear me, you know, that <laughs> sort of thing, working out. I was like, I could, you know, like Daredevil, he doesn't really have any powers. I could just do that. And, um, you know, and, the th you know, there were th th the things that kind of got me off of that first was uh, Prince and then um, and then uh, then getting involved in political organizations, because I think, um, you know, what that mindset would have led me to is becoming a cop. Right. That's that's what superheroes are. Right. So. Um, and that's, you know, so, so, but, but, you know, I had outside influences, but, you know, TV and movies, they tell you how the world is. We, you know, there are many of us in this room who have never been to, say, Delhi in India, right? But we have a picture in our head of what it looks like. We may even have a picture in our head of what it sounds like there, what the streets are like, what the people are like. And for most of us, we got that from a James Bond movie. Right? And so it, it, it changes our view of what the world is. Tell me about the like visual effects or like using practical effects more than VFX or CGI. Yeah. Um, so I, I think like right now, and right now we've, we're so used to CGI and it's not that we, always think it's real like when we see the hulk we don't think he's real we 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 suspend our you know we suspend our disbelief and that's fine that's what we're supposed to do um for everything but i think we're so used to a certain kind of suspension of disbelief that we've we've decided that's how it should be and then it also becomes not amazing right now you could have a cgi skyscraper stand up walk over and take a shit and it wouldn't be amazing and that should be amazing. If you saw a skyscraper walk over and take a shit, that would be fucking amazing. <laughs> but there's something that's lost. There's something that's lost in, in, in um, just having it exist in pixels only um, and not hitting the air. You know, even with music, oftentimes, um, you know, right now, especially with Pro Tools, you could be like, let's not put it through the amp because we can just put it directly into the Pro Tools and decide later and use different plugins. Um, and for me, I think it needs to hit the air. Like, I think that there's, maybe that's superstitious, but I think there's something that we haven't figured out about digitizing light and sound that, um, that, that we're missing. Mm -hmm. And so I think that too, so, so practically, with practical effects, you get textures, that you normally wouldn't have. You, and, and sometimes they're felt and the, you just kind of know that it's a little different. And, um, you know, um, and, 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 I, and, and you, you have a different connection. It's a little bit, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit off. So, you, so you're, you're not in your comfort zone of, of watching it. And, it, and, it, and in that way, it feels weird, um, and real in the same way that maybe really seeing a skyscraper stand up and take a shit would because you feel like, oh, something's off here as opposed to this is a movie, right? I mean, not saying that you don't get both of them, but that's what I'm going for. And, and not, so we didn't use CGI, but we did use VFX in this. So we did, you know, we're comping stuff together. We're, you know, um, doing that sort of thing, but we used, we had, uh, you know, we had a 13 foot tall puppet. We had uh, everybody made in half scale, um, uh, half scale puppets. We had, you know, 
a, a half scale, uh, half scale rooms and full scale rooms. So and had two cameras going on at the same time. Everything basically, I would have, I I pitched the behind the scenes of Lord of the Rings, and that's how we got it. You know, and 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 you know, I was able to because because also. Uh, many VFX folks right now will tell studios, oh, that's not the way you do it. That's really like, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so I think there was a, a lot of that going on. But luckily, in the Bay Area, we have a lot of the old Star Wars folks, John Knoll, Dennis Murin, Phil Tippett. I got them to chime in early. And they were like, yeah, you can do this, blah, blah, blah. It's really easy. You know, it's not. But <laughs> they said it. So... It made it seem like we could do it. What does it mean to you artistically to set your work in Oakland? Well, you know, for me, I'm, I'm always looking to uh, put myself in the best position as an artist that I can be, you know, being able to understand everything, you know, uh, that, 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 that there is. And so, I, I want to be grounded as an artist, and by grounded, let's say, let's take that word away because it's used a lot, but um, I want to have enough mastery of my surroundings, what they look like, what they feel like, what, what, how people live in these places, to uh, be able to use them as colors in my palette, right? And I, you know, I, I want to be able to point the camera wherever I want to point it. I want to uh, have an idea that I know what these people are. So that's always, you know, and, and in my music, like, even though I'm not necessarily saying, here's a story taking place in Oakland, it is in my head because I don't want to be separated mm -hmm. from it, right? I, um, so it's, you know, it's a subjective thing, but I think um, that's, that's the thing. Now, with this, we shot uh, most of it in because most of it was interiors because of the forced perspective stuff and also what we didn't know, like I think we thought we needed more space than we needed to do the forced perspective and we, we actually could do those things in locations. So, but some of the figuring around that um, led us to be like, we're gonna have to do most of this on stage and all of that and so it ended up making Louisiana be the place that we filmed most of it. And then we shot a bunch of exteriors in Oakland. Okay. This is my last question, and then we can take questions from the audience. Um, but tell me about casting this and bringing together this ensemble. Yeah. Um, so as I was writing the first episode, uh, Jarrell's face started coming in my head, right? And I was like, OK. Okay, this is Jarrell Jerome, and it's the first person that I said that it should be, um, and um, and at the time he was, you know, people knew his work from Moonlight, and I think May I can't remember when uh, when they see us came out, but he hadn't yet won the Emmy. Once he won the Emmy, it was like okay, we can sell this as he's the lead because you know it's all of those sorts of things. Um, but so that was Jarrell, and you know, I knew I needed someone whose face we could follow, mm -hmm. right? Um, and 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 who we could feel, and and that that would be with all the fantastical stuff, you have to have it be about humanity. Like, there's no reason to do it if it's just like, here's a crazy thing, here's a crazy thing, here's a crazy thing, because you know, for me, I. I step back from it. And I know, and I think pay, maybe I'm accused of that. But I think what I do is I try to connect, you know, have the people connect with the characters and the experiences uh, via the characters. So I, we needed that. Um, uh, I saw a, a tape of Olivia Washington and um, doing the character of Flora, uh, actually a monologue that comes up later that's in, in this. And um, even though I kind of said that there was a sadness and it's written into the story, she just was doing something I had not 
I had not imagined the character doing. It was, it, it taught me something, that her audition tape taught me something about uh, Flora. And I was like, okay, it's gotta be her. Then, um, you know, then, then Brett, I think I saw his audition tape and the first thing I heard was the voice. I was like, he, he, he has this high ass voice and sounds like Chris Tucker. <laughs> and, and, and to me, you know, like there's, we're kind of in a place where everybody's trying to be this sort of like leading smooth dude and with the voice deep and like speak in a certain way. And, um, you know, I was tired of that. And I felt like this is really how people talk. It was a, him letting himself be. And then we did a, did a, a chemistry read and it was just, it, it, and I, I didn't even realize Jarrell and Brett had worked together before and knew each other. So uh, that really worked. Um, and then Kara, uh, for reasons, if you haven't seen it, I won't talk. There's a certain aspect to her character where she has to be, uh, who plays Jones, um, she has to be this kind of ringleader. And I, I needed that, that aspect to this character. And, and, and um, her being an Obie Award winning, Tony nominated uh, uh, theater actor um, really helped her get there, you know. And so, you know, so that, that's, that's where that is. Um, uh, Walton Goggins. I had been um, wanting to work with him since Sorry to Bother You. Um, he was the first person I talked to for the hero. And um, he just started breaking into a monologue, like, here's what the hero would say. <laughs> I, when I had a meeting with him, like he's, I was like, he's like just performing as the hero. I was like, okay, <laughs> there you go. That's that. And then, um, <laughs> And then, uh, then Elias Barnes, uh, who plays Scat, um, just a personality that draws you in, that that you can tell he's connecting with whoever he's talking to and figuring them out, and um, and you know, an amazing actor like them all. Um, then then uh, Mike Epps, uh, you know, he's Mike Epps, right? Like. <laughs> He's Mike Epps, and um, like, what's what's cool about him is, uh, you know, like everything you see him say, it just it feels real. It, it, he he he, even though he's like, you could say he's the most outlandish of of everybody. He's a funny comedian, this and that, but because of that, he knows how people are. And you know he just he gives us something that that grounds the character. Uh, Carmen been wanting to work with her forever. I just told her you you gotta you have a role you're playing. So I clear the schedule, and she was like, <laughs> she she made it happen. Um, okay, we can. Oh, uh, did I forget somebody? We got we also got a lot of really cool cameos in this too because we've got like a show within a show on there and we ha we have a lot of really cool cameos throughout the whole thing too um let's take questions from the audience if you want to step to the mics or we have some from the south by southwest go app um i like this question from an activist perspective how do you measure or know if your films are having an impact um and changing the conversation, or however you define your objective? Well, I mean, for a long time with my music, that was a big problem, right? Like, especially since we're doing music in the 90s, there's no social media, this and that. You, like, hear things, and people tell you stories of how it affected them, but that, that takes a long t that In those days, it would take a long time to get to you. So, like, every day I was questioning so maybe that's wrong when you said, were there any doubts before? But I, I had doubts about whether this was the, whether, you know, it was having any effect. And over the years, then I heard, would hear stories, like with the music, you know, like one time um, 
there was this dude, this dude that was a chief of one of the First Nation folks in Canada that it, uh, you know, had gone through this battle where they had a shootout with the Mounties and, um, you know, and it, it, a standoff for days, and then they ended up being exonerated. But he was like, you know, the only thing that kept us going during that shootout with the Mounties was playing Genocide and Juice on loop. And I was like, you know, just thinking about those things. And now that's not necessarily connected directly from idea to that, but seeing that how my music worked in with that. With Sorry to Bother You, you know, we, we've been having this strike wave that's still going on that the mainstream media doesn't talk about. But over the last couple of years, we've had uh, thousands of strikes in the United States. And I constantly get uh, messaged from people either on strike or having had just gone on strike that, look, we got, our, we got everybody to vote to, be in the, uh, you, to, to, to make a union or to go on strike by playing Sorry to Bother You. Mm -hmm. so, there's, so there's direct. <laughs> you know, and, and, and even from that, people being like, I decided to be an organizer because of that movie. And, and so I would get that feedback about people deciding to be organizers from listening to the music. Um, you know, like uh, we have a song called The Guillotine that like gets people pumped at, uh, at uh, direct actions, things like that. So I'm able to get those things. Like it, th that's the only way I can measure it is from that feedback. Okay, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I screened Sorry to Bother You at Emerson College while we were organizing the staff union there. So I, I, I can give you that feedback. Okay. <laughs> Very helpful. And um, I wanted to ask you how you engage with South by Southwest as an activist. How do you get people engaged in conversations about what's going on in this country? And how do you get them to act? You're saying, how do we do it at South by Southwest? Yeah, I mean, th like the pl the platform you have. I'm doing a session tomorrow. Yeah, I'm going to all these conversations, and people aren't even engaging with, you know, with what's going on. Yeah, well, I think the the key to those types of things in general is to have a winnable campaign that someone could that you present for people to get involved with. Like, so for instance, at your college, you were organizing a staff union. If it was just about how do you, you know, if it was more theoretical, like, do we agree with this or not, people wouldn't be as engaged with that. But there was something that had to do with their material circumstances uh, that allowed them to be involved. Um, what One of the things that I noticed early on when I, you know, was a teenager help, uh, helping out with the Watsonville cannery workers strike was they had had all of these struggles going on between the Filipino workers, the Mexican workers, and the Portuguese workers. And for, for years in that community, people fighting each other, you know, um, and, and, you know, one group going on strike when the other ones didn't. And that had been going on for years. But at this point, they had a strike and they had a goal. And and before that, they had had all these meetings like, how do we have multiracial unity? How do we, you know, and it was just like a theoretical thing. Like, how do you get it? Let's have a dance. Let's do this. But once they had a strike where they're on strike together and the thing was they all needed to strike together, then they had all of these, um, this multiracial unity for, a, a, because there was a goal to go to. So... I think sometimes it's also hard to measure, and I think that's the same thing with me with my art, like it's hard to measure like, is it doing anything until there's a campaign for it to be useful for, right? And, and, and a campaign that has, and, and, and not like, and I've been involved in the past and stuff like, fight racism, like, mm -hmm. you know, like what do you do, mm -hmm. right? But when you have a, a goal that's winnable, we're gonna do A, B, and C then um, you're able to get people engaged and you're able to measure that. Are you getting involved in this or not? And then people have to decide, this is something that does affect my life. I don't want to fuck with that, or I do. And the, 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 the struggle becomes uh, different. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's go to this side. Hi. Um, I, I was curious with your, 
your background in radical politics, if you feel like you've um, like had to either moderate or compromise your views as you work with, you know, big corporations and how you navigate that, uh, your own values. Yeah. Well, I mean, luckily for me, like, that's kind of what I came in. I came in saying the things that I'm saying right now, like, and, and so anybody that works with me, they, they're, they know what they're buying in on. They're not like, can we, you know, get something that's, you know, getting the democratic party elected, you know, that sort of thing, you know? Um, that, you know, so, so from the point of engage, engagement, there is that, the, there, there's that point. Um, and, and here's the thing. So the, the part to, to understand about all of this is, you know, we have an analysis of how f things function, um, but it doesn't mean that, the, the, and, and, and they happen no matter what personalities are in there. Like, I don't think us having a better, better personalities being the ruling class will change the way things are. It's the way things are. But what that means is there are contradictions. So uh, I, I tell this story and it has to do with that, is that, um, and this is not really my story, this is Tom Morello's story, who's a friend of mine, and him and Rage Against the Machine, they were gonna do a music video on Wall Street. I forget which one it was, they did it on Wall Street. Somebody knows what that was. Uh, um, and it was directed by Michael Moore. And the idea was they were just gonna go play loud and live film that and that everybody was going to be so pissed off that they sent the police and they'd get arrested and that's the music video right well they go out there and they play and people look they play the song again they start closing the security doors and police are kind of looking and they play it a couple more times and soon they start hearing this loud sound from down the street and around the corner it's like ah! It's getting louder. They play the song again, and then the sound is really loud, and nothing's happening. But then they see coming from around the corner is a crowd of hundreds of Wall Street workers in suits saying, Suits for rage! Suits for rage! <laughs> and that's, and, 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 and what, what that has to do with is this is that those folks in those suits, they, they, technically agreed with what Rage Against the Machine was saying. <laughs> but there was, there's no movement that makes people think they can do anything about it, right? So people like, fuck it, I get this job and this. This is what I can do. This is the best thing I can do. So you have people all over. So ever since Sorry to Bother You, you know, all through the entertainment industry are people being like, I'm glad I can finally work on something I agree with. I'm glad I can do this. I'm glad, you know, and from all sorts of levels because nobody thinks that they are part of the, the system. Everybody thinks that they are the exception and we're all part of it. And that's, be, and, and, and the thing is, it, because it doesn't have to do with behavior, it has to do with, with changing, the, changing the fact that capitalism uh, operates off of the primary contradiction of the exploitation of labor. And until you change that, you're not going to wiggle out of it. You're going to be, you know, and, and so if I want to talk to people, I'm ending up doing, you know, our first album came out on uh, EMI, which doesn't exist anymore in, in that form. But, uh, you know, one of the biggest, you know, corporations ever. Right. And so, you know, it's it, it, my my goal is not to uh, make a nicer capitalism. Right. To do like this. You know, my goal is to help people understand how the working class can organize themselves to uh, make a movement that eventually overthrows capitalism and creates a system in which the people democratically control the wealth that we create with our labor. So, um, so that being said, what, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm wanting to, to get my stuff out to the 
the you know widest audience I can. Thank you. Okay, that's all the time we have. Um, thank you, Boots Riley. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.